Good afternoon, everyone. I love that song. You should just keep playing. Um, I'm not going to make you dance, don't worry. Um, but I am going to ask you to start by closing your eyes. Can everyone close their eyes? Okay, I love this. I'm on the stage. I can see everyone who has their eyes open. So <laughs> just close your eyes. Okay, I want you to imagine that you lend a thousand dollars to someone you have never met. Now I want you to imagine that you're in your car and you're driving around Sydney and you spot this lovely house that you would love to stay in and you knock on the door and you ask them if you can rent it for the week. And now I want you to ignore all the advice your parents gave you and to get in a car with a total weirdo and go on a trip with them. You can open your eyes now. Now, I'd like to ask you, raise your hands, um, how many of you, for how many of you, are those ideas a little bit strange or a little bit kooky? Could you raise your hand if you think those ideas are a, bit, a little bit strange? So about two-thirds. How many of you are these ideas the new normal? So about 20 people. Well, the staggering thing is every single one of those ideas is actually behind a billion-dollar company. So, renting houses from total strangers is the premise behind Airbnb, a company now worth $25 billion. Lending money to total strangers is the premise behind Lending Club, a peer-to-peer -peer lending platform, over $5 billion. And then, of course, Uber, uh, the new form of transportation that is now worth a whopping $50 billion. So what I want to do today is take you into my weird and wonderful world that I study, and it's basically this new world where a currency is emerging, and it's a currency that I call trust between strangers. And I want to do two things with you today. I want to show you how it's bringing these ideas to market and how they're disrupting different industries incredibly fast, but I also want to share with you how it's changing our adoption of new ideas. So before I take you into the future, let me just take you back a little bit on my journey that I went on into one of the first marketplaces that I studied that is really built on this dynamic of trust, and that is, of course, eBay. Now, some of you may have heard this legend, this myth, that eBay was started by Pierre Media to help his girlfriend buy and sell Pez dispensers. Do you all know what they are? They're like, they pop candy out their mouth. They're kind of weird. Anyway, this is actually rubbish. It was made up by the PR department of eBay because they decided that the true story was too geeky. And the true story that I discovered goes like this, that Pierre Media decided as an experiment to put this broken laser pointer up for auction on his personal website to see if there was anyone in the world that would bid on this broken laser pointer. Now, he was even surprised himself that within 24 hours, he received a bid for $13.83. So he wrote back to the guy and said, you do realize this laser pointer is broken, and the gentleman replied, I'm a collector of broken laser pointers. <laughs> now, I didn't know it. This story I came across eight years ago, and it set me on this wonderful adventure, this wonderful path of discovery. And what I saw in this story was actually two essential ingredients of the collaborative or sharing economy, as it's often referred to. And basically, Pierre was a visionary, because what you see in eBay is how technology is creating two things. The first is the efficiency to match millions of haves with millions of wants in ways on a scale that have never been possible before. But it's that second ingredient that I find really fascinating, and we're just beginning to understand how technology creates a new kind of social glue to form between strangers. That means that people can borrow and lend, that it changes the relationship between producers and consumers, and this is really at the basis of what I call the collaborative economy. Now, I'm just going to say up front, I don't like the term the sharing economy. And the reason why is I haven't met one user in the space that describes it as sharing. I haven't met many of the entrepreneurs that think of the behavior as sharing. And what this space really is about is a transformative lens in how we think about unlocking value 
and how we think about trust. So the way I define the collaborative economy is that it's an economic system of marketplaces that take unused assets. Now, those assets can be anything, like that broken laser pointer, they can be the skills and talents of people in this room, they can be empty seats in cars, they can be spaces in people's homes, and they unlock that value by putting them in networks and marketplaces that match these wants and these haves in ways that bypass traditional institutions. Now, what's really interesting to me is that when I first started researching this, and I should say, when my book came out, I think it was 2009, 2010, um, it was a complete and utter failure. It was a horrible experience in my life. Um, I kid you not, in the first two weeks, it sold a grand total of 12 copies. I called the publisher and I said, are you sure there are no zeros missing? And they said no, and I happened to be in London at the time with my grandma, and she said, well, actually, you only sold six because I bought the other six on Amazon. <laughs> The point of me sharing this story with you is, first of all, when you're early with an idea, it can be incredibly lonely, and you kind of have to sit with it and figure out um, what is it that's not connecting with people. But the really interesting thing was that when these ideas started to first emerge, people thought it was a reaction to the recession. They thought it was about people being frugal, figuring out how to make and save money from their extra stuff. But what I saw happening was this really powerful structural shift underway. And it's something that I call distributed power, where basically we're moving away from a business and society that places trust in these top-down, centralized institutions. And we're moving towards this world of distributed, connected communities. And this world of distributed, connected communities changes who has power. It changes the way we trust um, brands, and it changes the way we access products and services. So let me start with the bad news first. And the bad news is that research study after research study shows a collapse of trust in traditional institutions. So I'm just going to show you two briefly. Um, please forgive me, ComBank. I know I'm at a banking conference, but there really is a point to this. So um, Gallup uh, in the US, they have tracked public confidence in major institutions since 1993. And I looked at the results this year, and it was staggering, because for the first time in history, there was a decline in trust in every major institution. So banks, 28% of the US confidence now have trust in traditional banks, 24% for newspapers, papers, 21% for big business, and Congress, only 8%. So this idea of, trust me, I'm a banker, I'm a lawyer, I'm a politician, even I'm a priest, I don't think so. Now, the other interesting thing is that Endelman um, is a really interesting media company that trucks, tracks the state of trust across 27 countries, and they've been doing this for 15 years. And again, in 2015, it was the first time that two-thirds of the 27 countries tracked all showed a decline in trust against every single, single major institution. So the world has officially collapsed into a state of distrust of these traditional institutions. That's the bad news. The good news is that history shows us that when one system collapses, another system has to rise up. That's how the world works. And societies can't function without trust. Trust is the social glue of exchange. It binds relationships, and it greases the will of business. So what I'm studying is that when one thing collapses, this institutional trust collapses, what is rising up to take its place? And the interesting thing is it's this new alchemy of people trusting one another directly. Now, the beautiful thing is that it's giving rise to some weird and wacky ideas. So, I don't know about you, this is a company that just received $10 million in San Francisco, San Francisco. it's called Shuttle. Now, I actually love the school run most days because it's the only moment of the day that both my children sit still, because they're strapped in, and um, we have a little chat about their day. Um, but there's some days, like today, where it's just not logistically possible. So some mother had this insight of 
launching Uber for shuttle runs, which is called Shuttle. And what's in really interesting is that you can only be a shuttle driver if you have um, two years of care experience. So if you've been a parent, you've been a nanny, and it's hugely successful. So what they're doing is monetizing all these school runs that parents are doing and making life a little bit easier for other people. This is also one that I came across in the UK recently. And I, I know, it's really sad. I'm not advocating for it, it's really sad. And what I try and do in my work is look at the extreme. So I thought, what are things that um, people are unlikely to trust other people with? So their children, well, Shuttle's kind of done that. Maybe they don't really want to share their partners. And next is their pets, right? Well, I was wrong, because Borrow My Doggy and similar services around the world are going through phenomenal growth. Where the sad thing is, many people are saying that full ownership of a pet is too much responsibility in their lives. So they're figuring out how other people, they can trust other people to borrow their dog in the week, and they have that dog to play with on the weekends. 10,000 new people are signing up to this service every single month. And the one that blew me away, and maybe this is just personal, because my parents did drum it into me that you should never get in a car with a stranger, is Blah Blah Car in France. And I should say up front that Blah Blah Car has recently received $100 million in investment. This isn't like Uber. This is a genuine ride-sharing platform that matches people who are offering a ride with people who need a ride going at the same time to the same destination. And the amazing thing about Blah Blah Car is how people find their matches. So they find the functional match, but then the social profiles are extremely important. So people say the kind of music they like and whether they have pets and if they're a smoker. But the most important identifying factor has become how much you talk in the car. <laughs> so <laughs> if you do not like talking a lot, like my dad, you say you're blah. If you're kind of like me, where you want a little bit of chit-chat, but then look out the window, you're blah, blah. And if you're like my mum and you're going to talk all the way from London to Paris, you're blah, 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 blah. Now, the reason why this is so important is that what we're learning is that through these kinds of social profiles, which is really like the next generation of social media, is that people are discovering they can feed the social self. This is the side in all of us that seeks connection and belonging. So on Blah Blah Car, yes, the ride is a lot cheaper, but they're actually discovering that it's a social experience. Now, the staggering thing is that we may sit there and laugh and think this is kind of a niche thing, which is how we often react to these ideas, but Blah Blah Car now transports more people every single month than the Eurostar. Over two million people use this platform, and the head of Eurorail in Europe recently stood up and said, the biggest threat in the future isn't trains, isn't planes, it's blah, blah, car. Because what they're doing is reinventing the way people think of getting around. So this is just a handful of ways of how we're seeing how technology is creating and stretching trust to make these somewhat wacky ideas become really normal. But what's really interesting to me are ideas where it's really difficult to see how we're going to go back to the old way of doing things. So I thought that I'd pick two completely different ones. One, international money transfer, and the other, taxis. So these are the two founders of TransferWise. And what's really interesting to me about these founders, their names are Christo and Tavit, is they're pretty typical of many entrepreneurs that I meet, successful entrepreneurs, I say. Successful entrepreneurs do not say, I'm going to create the Uber of X, or I'm going to create the Airbnb of toys. What they do is they find pain in their lives. They find a problem that they understand better than anyone else, and they marry that pain and build a solution around it. Now, the pain that Christo and Tavit had is one that many of you may have had, which is uh, sending money overseas, tra um, sorry, um, changing currencies, ex currency transfer. Come on, Rachel, currency transfer. So 
Tavit was living in um, the UK and Christo was living in Estonia, and they both discovered just through conversation that they were sending money um, in opposite directions. So he said, this is crazy. Why are we paying the bank fees? Why are we getting completely ripped off by these charges? Why don't we just exchange money directly? Now, a key part of this story is that Tavit was actually the first employee of Skype. And what he saw was exactly the same behavior, that they could use these peer-to-peer -peer systems to change international money transfer. So they've launched this peer-to-peer -peer currency uh, platform called TransferWise. Uh, it's done over $3 billion in the first 18 months, and it matches people with opposite currency needs. I need Euro, someone else needs Aussie dollars. We're directly matched, cutting out the banks altogether. Now, I'm going to show you a quick video that brings to life not just how TransferWise works, but the spirit of this company. This is the old world of money, a world where banks make up the rules, full of hidden fees and nasty surprises, especially when you send money abroad. You're told it's cheap, even free, and then wham! Yep, that's the unfair exchange rate hitting you. All in all, you lose £50 of every £1,000 you transfer. It's a scandal, as old as the banks. But now, just like phone calls, music and travel, the old world's been flipped on its head. Welcome to TransferWise. Built by the brains behind Skype, backed by Sir Richard Branson, it's the clever new way to send money abroad. You see, technology's moved on. Money transfers just don't need to cost so much anymore. No skyscrapers, no fancy suits, no hidden fees. Just people everywhere, connected by TransferWise. All paying 10 times less than what their banks used to charge them. It's only fair. So next time you transfer money, TransferWise. So. The interesting thing about this video is that, yes, it's kind of sticking a finger up at the traditional banks, but it's also, I, I'm really not in doing this intentionally for CBA. Um, <laughs> It's raising a really important point. Like, it's raising a really important point for people like CBA, for every one of you that's in a traditional institution. Because what these new brands are saying is that you don't need to have these intermediaries facilitating these exchanges, that there's a direct form of trust. And they take this notion of transparency, getting people to change their behavior really seriously. So this was, these are just some posters. I was recently back in London. I do actually live in Sydney. And these were just some of the ones that I took um, that is showing you that basically their biggest enemy is apathy. They have to get consumers to realize that they don't have to place their trust in the bank. They can place these trusts in these new institutions. And they take this really seriously. So in the middle, this is Tavit and Christo, and this was a thing they did in the front of the Bank of England where they decided they would take their clothes off, and on their chest, they, it says this thing called Nothing to Hide. And this actually started this massive viral campaign all around the world where people were taking their clothes off in front of financial institutions, asking them, do you have nothing to hide? Now, the point of this is that it illustrates this really important shift going on. It's not that institutions are going to collapse and that institutions don't play a role in our society. It's that we're moving from an age of institutional trust to an age that's built on peer trust. Now, completely different world, but let's go into taxis because Uber is in the press every single day. And the interesting thing is it's based on a really similar dynamic. You don't need to have any training. You don't need a taxi license. Anyone with a car and some extra time can now become an Uber driver. And it's phenomenal when you think about Uber, a $50 billion company in less than five years. To put that in perspective, it makes it one of the 100 most valuable companies in the world. Now, what's staggering about Uber is when you look at the impact on the taxi industry. So this is just a graph showing San Francisco, and what it shows you is that Uber and some of its other competitors in this space, Lyft and Sidecar, have taken two-thirds of the traditional market in less than three years. I was recently over in the States, and the taxi commissioner thinks that traditional taxis will have a lifeline of 18 months, 18 months to reinvent that business. 
So I look at things like this, and it's fascinating, right? Because this idea that people never thought would work, getting in the car with total strangers, not licensed by any regulatory body, wouldn't take off. And I look at this graph and I say to the taxi industry, are we having our Kodak moment? <laughs> Is this the moment that not technology, but these new tri trust dynamics are changing your industries in ways that cannot be reverse. And the interesting thing to me is how people react to this type of change. Do they embrace it or do they fight it? Now, many of you would have seen that the taxi industry are not embracing this change. They're organizing what they are saying are protests all around the world to try and get governments to ban Uber. These are just some photos from some protests in Europe. And the interesting thing is the reaction to these protests. So the taxi industry think this is going to make the public stand up and say we should ban Uber and the government is going to regulate it out of existence. But that's not what's happening. So this is just one tweet that I caught. He is the MP for business. That's what's key. He says, does anyone have details of this Uber app? Everyone's talking about it sounds awesome. I'd never heard of it until today. And on the day of these protests, sign-ups went up by 750%. <laughs> now, the importance of sharing this story for you, with you is one of the common mistakes I see leaders make is they believe they can reverse the behavior. They believe that somehow they can reverse the story. But the fact is that once the genie is out the bottle, you can't put it back in. You can't reverse the consumer behavior. So the second area of my work that I have been studying is not just what are these ideas and how does trust make them work, but why on earth do we accept them? You know, my parents, they, they think they gave me a nice education and I had a nice job with President Clinton and then I went and studied, decided to explore this weird world, right? And they're always going, these ideas are never going to work, Rachel. Why do they work? And I thought this was a really interesting question. So I tried to um, discover what it was that was making people accept these ideas and have developed this framework called the trust stack. Now, the trust stack basically thinks of trust in three levels. So the first level is you have to trust the idea. Then you have to trust the platform or the company. And then you have to trust the other user. And the interesting thing that I've seen is that more as you fall through this trust stack, imagine like a coin going through the top, and as you go through it again and again and again, over time, your culture, the, sorry, the behavior changes, the culture around a behavior changes, and then the system changes. So let me bring this to life with Airbnb. Let me show you how people fall through the trust stack to change the behavior of travel, and eventually the system starts to change with it. So trust the idea. So who is a host or a guest on Airbnb? Just raise your hand. It's about half the audience. So for those of you who don't know, Airbnb is a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace. It matches people who have places to stay with people who um, are looking for places to rent. And you'll find listings like this on the platforms, holiday homes, people's spare rooms. But one of the beautiful things about Airbnb is you can also find tree houses. This is one of the most popular categories if you want to stay in a tree house. Um, airplane hangers, igloos, and this is a teepee I stay in in San Francisco where the hosts make $25,000 a month renting out this luxury teepee. <laughs> and Airbnb were geniuses, right? Because what they realized and how they've made it different from stays is you have to create a market for things that never had a marketplace before. Now, what's staggering about Airbnb is I can give you all kinds of stats, but this slide says it all. This company was launched in 2008. It only really started to have traction in 2011, 2012, and now it is the second most valuable hospitality brand in the world just after Hilton Hotels. And the frightening thing is I look at this graph and I can see how Airbnb will get to the top, but it's really difficult to imagine how Marriott's going to regain that second spot. That's how powerful this currency of trust is. Now, the interesting thing is that when people look at Airbnb, they often mistake it as a marketplace for spaces. That's what they think its ingredient of success is. How do we replicate this marketplace for spaces? But that is not the secret source of Airbnb. Airbnb is a community. Its success 
depends on millions of interactions between hosts and guests. Think about what it's doing. It's having to discover this whole new DNA of trust between people who don't know one another. And the reason why I find this so fascinating and why it's, you know, we're just in the nascent stages of understanding this is this is a very different dynamic of trust to the one that I saw on eBay. Because on eBay, you could be anonymous, right? You could have a silly pseudonym. And the interactions stay digital. But the amazing thing about Airbnb that they are figuring out is this online to offline trust how we use digital tools to create face-to-face -face interactions, how we use digital tools to change our behaviors in the physical world. So this is the top layer of the trust stack. I've got to trust that this idea works. The next layer is I have to trust the platform. I have to trust Airbnb, the company. Now, the incredible thing about Airbnb is millions of nights have been booked on this platform, but things do go wrong. So this was a guest, um, Mike. This is your worst nightmare. I'm going to show you the video. And basically, Mike was going away for a week, and like many hosts, he decided to offset the cost of his trip by renting out his apartment to what he thought was a family of four coming to Canada for the weekend for a wedding. And this is what he found when he came back home. Is this yours? Yes. Okay. Do you see anything that's obviously missing? <laughs> um, I know you're just kind of the first few pieces. It's, it's going to take some time for you to figure out what's missing. Yeah. Is that just a few files? That's his shoe right there. Oh my goodness. Okay, you get the picture. I'm going to move on because I'm going to spare you the toilet bowl full of condoms because what actually happened, yes, was that this was an orgy. So he wrote, Mark, I mean, this is our home. This is our sanctuary. We've got a five-year-old and a one-year-old and the sense of violation, the lie that was told and the trust that I had in somebody and this happens. When we came in, one of the police said that this isn't a party. This was a drug-induced orgy. Now, the reason I show this, that this is the anomaly, but the interesting thing is how does the company respond? So this is Airbnb's response. We've been in very close contact with the host, and we're working quickly to reimburse them under our million host guarantee, which covers a host property in the rare event of damages. Over 35 million guests have stayed on Airbnb, and property damage is extremely rare. There's only actually been over 750 claims on Airbnb, which is staggering when they have 35 million interactions. But it raises a really important question, which is what is the role of the company when things do go wrong? What is the role of the company in this new age of peer-to-peer -peer trust? So the last level of the trust stack, and this is the one that we're really trying to figure out how to understand, is trust in the other user. And essentially what you're saying is, can I trust this other person? And what I've seen, I'll just go on for that, is in my research, this requires four different ingredients. So the first is verification. Is this person in the digital world, uh, sorry, is this person in the real world who they say they are in the digital world? The second is connection. So how do we know someone in common? Maybe we went to the same university. Maybe you know someone that I know. The third is interest in values. So like on Blah Blah Car, how much do you talk? Do you smoke? Do you have pets? Do we like the same music? And then the fourth are these ratings and reviews. Because trust is this really intangible quality, right? We've heard a lot of people talk about it today. So in this new world, how do you measure it? So what we're seeing are these rating systems. And the staggering thing about these rating systems is that you're not just rating the hosts. They're rating you as guests. So I don't know how many of you know this. In Uber, the driver is rating you as a passenger, as well as you rating the driver. This is astonishing when you think about it, that customers are no longer just rating companies, and the implications are enormous. Because what's starting to happen is that people are realizing that trust on these platforms has a measure. And this measure is something that I call reputation capital. And it's basically the sum of what this community thinks of you. 
And the reason why this reputation is so fascinating is it starts to transform the way we think about building trust in brands. Because if you think about the brands like Airbnb and Uber, they're made up of these millions of interactions of this kind of reputation. The other fascinating thing about this world of trusting other people is how these ratings are changing our behaviors in the real world. So let me ask you guys a question. Confession, actually. How many of you do this? How many of you leave towels on the floor of hotel rooms? Just raise your hands. Fully high up. OK, right. This is a photo of what I did in the Disney Swans Hotel in Florida. Never go there. It is a pit. But the shower leaks, right? You know, in those showers, and it all comes out. So I just chucked all the towels on the floor, and I was running out. And then I decided, this is so interesting, right? I'm going to take a photo of this because I would never do this as an Airbnb guest. And I would never do this as an Airbnb guest because of those damn ratings that I have advocated for the last eight years. Because I know that I will be rated as a guest as well as being rated as a host. But this has a really serious point, because I think one of the most fascinating dynamics that we're just starting to uncover is how online trust will change human behavior in the physical world in ways that we can't yet even imagine. So I passionately believe that for all the talk of technology and all the talk of disruption, the profound shift, the shift that we will look back in 50 years' time and really start to understand isn't about the technology. It's how technology is changing and creating a massive transformation around trust that will change systems and change behaviors in ways that we can't yet even imagine. Thank you very much.